Hello and welcome to Talk Gnosis. This is an entry in our Black Iron Prison series where we talk to people who may be outside of the quote unquote Gnostic world, philosophers, artists, creators, about their work, uh, about any connections to Gnostic themes, or at least where I can read in Gnostic themes. We've got Dr. Nina Power, philosopher, writer, Polish. Hello, Dr. Power. Hi. <laughs> nice to be here. <laughs> Uh, it's a real pleasure to to have you here. I'm, I'm a big fan of your work. I uh, have been for a long time. So uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's uh, a real pleasure, a real honor. Uh, but before we get to um, talking to you and to uh, anything that is pleasurable <laughs> for us to have to go through, the hell that is the commercial for our Patreon. Very quickly, uh, we can't do the show without your financial support. Uh, you can donate for as little as a dollar per piece of media per month by going to patreon.com slash gnostic we usually only charge for five or six pieces of media as well we do more than that uh and uh, you can put a cap on how much so if you're scared that we're going to do a million pieces of media you can put a cap on how much you're spending per month you can also go to paypal.com slash gnostic for uh one-time donations and finally i we understand these are difficult weird times if you're unable to help us out financially in that case uh tell people about the show uh send them your favorite episode it's probably going to be this episode so send it to a friend who will appreciate it uh share it on your social media uh like subscribe all that good stuff okay uh dr power um so what's your definition of pagan uh, paganism and what do you mean would you call yourself a pagan yeah well i i call myself lots of things but i suppose what i mean by it is a kind of um a preservationist relationship to nature above all else but also a kind of interest in re-enchantment and um, a kind of excavation of myth and heritage um, which are largely sort of occluded on the left um, because they're generally seen as potentially dangerous because anything that points to place um, might entail some kind of relationship between folk or people and place and um, understandably the left have been very wary of um, invoking any idea of of myth in this sense just kind of steering clear basically um but that also would include questions of um heritage and and history in, in a particular sense and so um i'm kind of interested um and there's a great film called arcadia which draws upon kind of uh, bfi archival footage of folk uh, rituals and i grew up in the countryside and there are still quite a lot of uh folk uh, things happening, um, you know, in relation to music and performance and so on. And I, I'm kind of interested in in what those things mean, I suppose, and, and what they tell us about ourselves and how they tie us to the land, I suppose, and how they, uh, you know, inform our relationship to nature. And again, I think nature is one of those categories which has been rather demonised <laughs> um, in many ways. And I suppose I'm, I'm interested in a, uh yeah, what it means to rethink nature outside of this kind of, well, you mentioned the black iron prison, but, you know, the, the Philip K. Dick idea, I mean, not only his, but, but you know, he has the insight about the, the Roman Empire. And so I, I'm interested in the outside, I suppose. So I'm interested in how we how we might name the outside. Um, and nature seems to be obviously one of these names. And, I, and I'm very uh, influenced by thinkers like Spinoza, um, who talks obviously about Deus Siva Natura, God or nature, and the idea of uh, a kind of panpsychism um, and how we might uh, understand ourselves as part of this um, this being. Yeah, if, uh, panentheism is something that comes up a lot in uh, on the show and in, in circles that uh, the modern Gnostics move in. But I I, I want to and I know you're you're using nature in. Um, Perhaps not in the sense that everybody uses it, but you know, nature in the collo colloquial sense, it, it, it's either indifferent to us or wants us dead. So why should we have quote unquote a relationship to it? Well, I mean, we're also part of nature. I mean, the other thing I want to say about being pagan that I'd also like to preserve is also the, the rustic kind of villager countryside aspect, which I think when we have a kind of liberal image of modern life, it's highly city based, it's highly industrialized, you know, and I live in London, you know, but there is a sense in which the, the modern subject is a kind of city dweller, 
you know, and I, I want to also say that there is something beyond this as a way of living. And it's obvious, of course there is, but I think there's there's often a, a failure to understand um, the countryside and, and, and some of the truths of the countryside. Um, so yeah, in, in relation to this question of, of nature, I suppose, you know, we are part of nature too. That would be one of my, uh, one of my feelings. Um, and that, you know, paradoxically, it's part of our nature to obscure that fact so that the way in which we develop technology actually turns us away from non-human nature in many ways um, and kind of uh, creates these sort of potentially artificial barriers between us and our own nature. Um, but that's also our nature. So we are this curious creature that does, does this sort of alienating uh, gesture. Um, so I suppose there's something a bit maybe provocative about it by trying to think about how we might um, actually also be in touch with other forms of knowledge that um, are related to how we are embodied. And, you know, I mean, you're talking about Gnosticism and I, and I, I think I probably have a, um, I, I don't know, I have my own understanding of what Gnosticism is, but it might, it might not at, at all relate to the, the way in which you're conceiving it. And I, I, I'm kind of curious to, to know a bit more about how you understand it. I was just revisiting the, the Culiano book today. Do you know this book, the tree, the tree of Gnosis, you know, and it's it's kind of fascinating. And I, you know, thinking about kind of contemporary heresies um, and whether we see the kind of mind body split in particular kind of reenacted over and over again um, in various um, kind of cultural um, meus, you know, whether it be to do with kind of veganism or vegetarianism or that, you know, various forms of asceticism or various attempts to, if you like, uh, escape the body through um, various uh, practices which don't necessarily see themselves as religious or don't necessarily, wouldn't necessarily describe themselves as Gnostic, but actually have an awful lot in common with um, various Gnostic heresies, um, which I find very strange and interesting. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. I, you know, I, I think for, the, I, I belong to a Gnostic community that, that is looking towards the ancient Gnostics, that is looking towards the Nag Hammadi, um, that is, uh, you know, really, but at the same time, it, it is drinking from that, that stream of Gnosis, right? Eating from that tree of Gnosis that the Kulian describes in the book. So we don't stop in the second or third century, and we are looking at these sort of Gnostic uh, movements over the last 2,000 years, as well as uh, high church mysticism, as well as 19th century occult revival, um, and and of course uh, now uh, the modern modern theology, continental philosophy, right? So um, you know I belong to a community that that is very low on dogma, um, so we're trying to still have a tradition while not having um, a lot of dogma. And, and sometimes that can be confusing to people, right? Because we're like, well, we have a tradition. So uh, we do use a lot of high church practices. We do look towards Nag Hammadi, but, but, um, but we don't really tell people uh, how, how to interpret it, I guess. So, you know, here's, here's, our, here's our touchstones and it's up to you to, to interpret it. And, and I think for the dualism for Gnosticism, uh, I, I really do think that it is overstated or or misunderstood, and, and that what the ancient Gnostics weren't necessarily getting at was the materiality a, as a prison, quite quite as crude as that. Um, but we're looking at the world, right, and the yeah. world system as oppressive. And, and I think too, and I, I, strictly speaking for myself, um, and this is my read into the ancient Gnostics. But hey, they're dead. I. <laughs> I can read in um, that it, it's what they're talking about is, is that human beings are divided beings. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily a, a, a mind body uh, a dualism, but instead that we are wounded and that we are contradictory and that we are divided. And that this is what they're trying to get at with the language and mythology of the of the the uh, times. Yes. No, I mean, I, I appreciate all of that. And thank you for um you know, out, laying it out. And I, I agree. I mean, it's interesting. You have almost like a Gnosticism in contemporary psychoanalysis, you know, as well. I mean, you know, like obviously like on the lack, we talk about psychoanalysis and, and Helen Rollins is one of our, um, you know, uh, um, hosts. And, you know, she's always pushing this, this line about the divided self. And, you know, you can read R.D. Lang and, you know, anti-psychiatry and there's, there's kind of repetition all over the place about what it means to be a divided subject. And, 
Sure, and I, and I suppose the question is where you see the division, um, whether, you know, how you see difference. So, you know, sexual difference, as you know, is one of the most contested um, areas for discussion in contemporary life. Um, and I think it's very revealing and indicative that sexual difference has become such a problem for our culture or has become this object of, you know, discursive, emotional kind of, you know, turmoil. Um, and I think there's a, a very, if we, if we zone back out, like when we think of the regime or <laughs> whatever we want to call it, the system or, you know, it's, I think there's something, there needs to be a kind of collective psychoanalysis about why certain things are causing particular cultural problems you know yeah. regardless of the details of how they're playing out yeah i i completely concur um but uh oh so going back a little bit when you were talking about re-enchantment did you actually have a vision for re-enchantment like uh, how we can do it because yeah i think that's partly what you know the project of, of me and my community um and you, we are trying to do that you know partly through sort of um the technologies of the occult revival, but partly through um, through uh, high church mysticism, right? Mm -hmm. So we are trying to have our cake and eat it too, but a lot of ritualism. Though we also do have uh, the people in our communities that, uh, again, because of this connection to uh, the romanticism, connection to uh, the, the occult revival, you know, we have people who uh, who have one foot in druidic worlds, even though that seems like a, a contradiction compared to Gnosticism. So that they are getting out in nature and, and doing rituals and reconnecting. So yeah, so, so I'm wondering if you have a vision for, for re-enchantment. Yeah, I mean, I think in a way, this is this is these are just kind of almost speculative intuitions, by the way, the things I'm yes. saying. They're not they're not really predicated on like a whole set of readings or scripture or something like that, but these are feelings, you know, in a way, or intuitions I've had, you know, often in entheogenic <laughs> states. But you know, something like, I suppose, everything that is enchanted is already here. I mean, one of the problems is like where the sacred is placed. I mean, this is also discussed in various writers true, too. And I'm very interested in Bataille and some of the early 20th century anthropologists of the sacred and ritual and also René Girard. And, but there is a sense in which we don't know where to place the sacred, like the, the bounds of the sacred and the profane are kind of both everywhere and nowhere all the time. You know, so re-ritualization is a process of trying to re-sacralize particular places or states of being or um, communal relation or, um, or you know, any kind of practice. And obviously mainstream religion has those as part, as a major feature of what it is, the repetition of the, the service or the liturgy or the, you know, the recitation or even singing, um, well, especially singing maybe. <laughs> um, and I suppose when I think about nature, capital N, in the way that I'm using it, it's kind of everything in the spin of it, spin as a sense. And so the re-enchantment is possible at every moment in a certain way. It's not that there is a utopian re-enchantment, like somewhere we can get to. It's that, for example, I mean, I can look out of my window and see this tree and it's in the middle of a kind of otherwise very, very you know, depressing council flat car park, right? With cars and rubbish bins and crisp packets. And, you know, but in the middle of this car park is this tree and the sunlight is mo at the moment streaming uh, across the tree. And there's this kind of utter, like incomprehensible sublime beauty, you know, and it's here, it's in the present moment. And so the re-enchantment I think is uh, a kind of imminent possibility of um, the world as we perceive it. It's not uh, somewhere else beyond. Um, I mean, I do do talk about a kind of uh, an ideal of re-enchantment or a process of re-enchantment or a desire for re-enchantment. But I think the basis upon which things can be re-enchanted is um, kind of omnipresent. Yeah. You know, and it can, of course, hint at something else, right? But it is also itself, you know. Yeah, I, I also have a strong uh, interest in... Um radical theology and atheistic Christianity, right? And, and um, so just seeing that that imminence and combining it with, with the Gnosticism, which is the understanding of the, this sort of dialectic, this flux, this flow of living in a contradictory world, which can often be a prison, but can also be completely divine. Um, so uh, a criticism that, that say, uh, my community gets is that what we're not actually doing is, is Gnosticism. It's, it's just 19th century romanticism. But, 
And, and people say this about uh, more religious forms of paganism, right? Wicca or, or what have you. But I, I like romanticism. Is, is, is this such a bad thing that romanticism is in these movements, in these thoughts, uh, uh, informing uh, these philosophies? No, I mean, not at all. I, I think, I mean, I'd, I'd have to pin down what, what is meant by romanticism, in, both in the criticism and in your kind of, you know, de defence of it. But I mean, when I, what comes to mind when you speak, for example, the, something I would absolutely defend as a, um, a, a kind of counterforce against the regime would be, would be poetry, you know, yeah. would be absolutely the kind of, uh, a, you know, spontaneous, um, um, uh, attempt or the the flow of language that itself is a kind of form of resistance against capture and against homogeneity so in that sense you know I think the the romantic kind of defense of like the ungrounded ground or the a, a kind of poetic poeticism um, I absolutely um, feel but like increasingly and, and when I sit down and, and write these sort of stream of consciousness kind of associative things I you know on some very minor level, they they are a way of also ritually preventing myself from um, writing in a machine like way, you know, yeah. because I do a lot of writing and and some of it, uh, well most of it is for um, for order if you so I mean like I'm writing for newspapers or I'm writing for um, you know someone has asked me to write about something and of course there's freedom within those constraints and I'm not you know totally interested in like a constraintless world I think that would be chaos but but they but there is something about the the associative um, wellspring almost of poetic writing that I feel and maybe that's that's at least what I what comes to mind when I think of romanticism yeah. that is that isn't subject to the the scientific the the lockdown homogeneous homogeneous world yeah well, well, actually, talking about your writing, I, I do have a question here on my question sheet. So, because you organically brought it up, but like stream of consciousness, um, the cut up method, and, and similar techniques of writing seem to me to be literally magic. Like, and, and there's literal similarities to to channeled writings, uh, angelic contact, you know, whatever John D was up to. Did you see anything magic about this particular way of creating? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, I just finished teaching this um, twelve-week course on angels, so we talked a lot about um, yeah, the muse and and kind of mediation and uh, divine contact and genius. And people were talking about people like Kanye and figures who actually are also claimed to be touched by angels. And you know, the question of channeling. We talked about spirit mediums and artists and uh, people like Georgina Horton. And you know, so there is a, there's obviously a kind of um, tradition of thinking about um, uh, writing and art in that way um, and I I yeah and, and you can see it in the surrealist too they they're actually a surprising amount of angels and surrealism um, maybe not surprising but you know it, you wouldn't necessarily think that these modern art movements would have so much kind of you know uh, now seemingly classical imagery or iconography. I mean, obviously Salvador Dali is an obvious exception, you know, major <laughs> example of that. But I suppose, um, yeah, I think there is something about being in trance-like states, for example. So, like, there's something very meditative. Uh, like, even when I'm doing reviews or something like that, like if I'm reviewing a record, I'll listen to it 40 times, and it'll become like a kind of meditative exercise in terms of um, channeling the if you like the creative work of someone else so that it, you almost rewrite what's what they've done through you in a way so I'm very interested in those acts of translation particularly when they're quite difficult like it's technically quite difficult to write about music because the the media are quite different in a certain way um so I'm interested in what it means to kind of translate yeah these things that are also translations by other people um and I think yeah, we perhaps in a in the culture we tend to think too much or focus too much on the idea of the individual artist and this person's self and what they think and so on. And it's not necessarily very interesting. And I think one of the the major things I remember from when Twitter started was like how boring and awful most celebrities were, or you know, most people who even people whose music or art you enjoyed. He's like, oh no, no, <laughs> I don't want to see this side of somebody, you know. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think that it's another space for the sacred or you know the divine. I think definitely. 
Yeah. So do we live in a bastard Gnostic age? Like, is, is there something especially Gnostic about these times? Um, yeah, I mean, insofar as I'm, I'm using Gnostic in a way which is, is, is probably not completely compatible with you. And I put, you know, and I'm not a, a, an expert on Gnosticism, right? But insofar as I understand something like the idea that we live in a kind of fallen world and that, um, you know, a lot of what is around is kind of uh, is evil and maybe preventing us from understanding things, um, you know, that we don't uh, have easy access to kind of wisdom and higher knowledge. Um, and that, that actually this is quite um, a difficult thing to attain and many things are kind of put in our, in our way to try to stop us, you know, in terms of being distracting. And, you know, I'm very interested in, in Ivan Illich um, and one of the concepts that he re resurrects from Aquinas and Aristotle is the idea of austerity, which doesn't mean what we mean by it today, but it means rather being without distraction. So it's the idea of being, for example, in a conversation with a friend without being distracted or enjoying the world without being kind of worrying about what you're doing next. And, you know, these forms of contemplative states or, you know, fully immersive um, experiences, uh, let's say, of the world. Um, and so I don't know. I mean, I definitely see that there is a kind of hostility to the body. I think this is and I, whether, you know, whether that's just to describe that as Gnostic. And I'm very I, I often get very confused when I think about Gnosticism because it seems to often be used critically. I mean, obviously, there are Gnostic heresies from the standpoint historically of the Catholic Church. These are these are bad things. Right. Like so the people who are refusing to have sex and get married and, and don't eat meat are, you know, the they're, these are heresies, right? So I was just reading the book of Timothy last week and, you know, there's this whole thing about Paul telling Timothy to, to you know, be, beware of the, the ones that begin with E. I can't remember what they're called, but the, those those Gnostics and, and obviously the Bogomils and the Cathars and, you know, these. So, but there's also a sense in which, I don't know, like people like Vroglin seem to suggest that um, all all politics is Gnostic in a sense, or all kind of industrial life is Gnostic somehow. Um, so so yes, and into or you could see Gnosticism positively, right? In terms of Gnosis as this kind of positive to aim, you know, or this goal or this this way of trying to access knowledge or Sophia. So yeah, I, I think I'm I'm very very in a way uh, in two minds about what we what I would understand by Gnosticism and and perhaps that's sort of some part of my development and my <laughs> understanding of it as well. Um, but I would say that yeah, I mean, in a way, I do think there are. I mean, maybe there's kind of negative or positive Gnosticism, right? I think there are things that are put in the way of understanding. Um, that might be described as Gnostic, but maybe from the standpoint of the church type criticism of heresies. So from a, like, I don't know, my pagan natural point of view, I think that the encouragement of the mind body split is a very bad thing. Right. So the idea that people are alienated from their bodies, that they feel like they have to change them, their bodies is, is very, very bad. Right. I think this is like this is terrible. And I think this is being encouraged by by um, a medical establishment in all kinds of kind of awful ways. And so, so I, I don't know, but I don't know if I would really necessarily, whether it be legitimate to describe that as Gnosticism or whether, you know, these, these moves towards transhumanism and so on are, are Gnostic. I'm not, I'm not sure. I'd be quite interested to know what you, you think about that. Yeah, well, I, I think your original definition, and this is of my own biases, of that, um, those distractions, cutting you off from the divinity of life, right? An, an oppressive system that is both internal and external, stopping you from experiencing what is transcendent right here in the mundane. You know, that that grooves right along with what I think I and many others um, uh, would define as Gnosticism. Now, for, for, the, for all these different definitions and uses, you, you know, the term is from the, the 1700s, right? And, and it is originally a scholarly term used to describe all these uh, originally the first and second century heresies, and then people applying them to the, these later heresies. But that doesn't mean that the term isn't unuseful. And, and finally, Dr. Power, and this is more my job than yours, is I, I believe that because there are all these tensions around the term, that Gnosticism is a uh, is a gem with uh, many facets. Mm -hmm. So it's it is unfortunately for for people like me and for people in these currents and for people trying to use this term 
Um, and uh, we have to grapple with all these different uses and all these different meanings. And, and I think that also does include that negative Gnosticism, as you said, a positive Gnosticism and a negative Gnosticism. And Gnosticism does play sort of a secret role in uh, Western thought more than people realize in both philosophy, both in religious beliefs and practices. So some of these understandings or maybe misunderstandings uh, that come from the Gnostics uh, uh, from the body, you might even be able to make a line from some of this modern thought back to some of these understandings of Gnosticism. So, you know, just because I like it doesn't mean that I... I, I um, uh, not responsible for grappling with, with negative Gnosticism. And, and I think I, I think that's it exactly. I think there is a positive and a negative understanding that is both historically rooted. And uh, if it's not historically rooted, people are using the term that way. So, you know, got to explore that. <laughs> yeah, great. <laughs> um, when it comes to religion and modern spirituality, and, and we've talked about this a little bit, you know, you've brought up sort of peak uh, peak experiences, altered states of being. A, a common narrative is a is a joyous conversion, uh, or you know, some sort of amazing mystical. I, I was part of of everything. Uh, you know, I flew up to the mountains, I danced with the gods, I saw Sophia. But um, many Gnostics describe their first step on the religious path as as an experience of pure existential horror. So it's it's a sharp uh, a, a sharp and horrible insight into like the brutalism of the cosmos. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you think that this is helpful, like such an experience, and that this can lead to flourishing, that it's good, or is it like just a bunch of losers like trying to make something cool out of their depression, uh, depressive episodes? No, no, no. I mean, I think you know I'm very interested in, for example, like depressive suicide or black metal as a genre. I've written a long mm -hmm. essay about it, and you know this is like in a way possibly the, the the bleak like most explicitly bleak form of of musical practice and the lyrics and and so on and um and yeah no I mean I, th I think you know what came to mind when you were speaking actually was an experience I had as a child in the countryside when I was walking in a country lane with my father and we came across a a cow that had been struck by lightning and she had been pregnant and the lightning she was dead the cow was dead and the the, the calf had half burst so it was kind of a horrible scene the cow was on her back and she'd been struck by lightning and then you know had sort of spontaneously burst or semi-birthed this calf and it was really quite a horrifying scene and I saw some other really disturbing things particularly around animals right as a child as and you know if you grew up in the countryside like it's you know you are confronted with <laughs> like certain forms of violence you know surrounded by farms and in a way that if you're in the city it's less likely obviously and um so I, so yeah I, I don't know there is something about that I think you know Simon Critchley a philosopher has this thing about how philosophy begins in disappointment and that actually like you have an encounter with something where you yeah something is very awful like you have a a terrible sadness like you you think oh you know oh no I'm going to die or or some people I love are going to die or everyone's going to die or you know um life isn't what I thought it was and and psychoanalysis would 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 you know be in the same kind of ballpark um but horror yeah I I I don't see why not I think I think unless you have an understanding of horror um you don't have an understanding of beauty you know and I'm quite interested in the political problem of beauty like how do we redistribute beauty like it's one of these really complicated mm -hmm. questions you know if you know coming from a from a left background although I, I don't really have much in common with the people who <laughs> describe themselves as left in the current moment but you know I, I feel like the left I, I was in the 90s you know as a teenager but um I think that yeah there is a kind of uh you know, beauty poses a problem at the level of of justice because beauty isn't dis, dis, you know dispersed equally. It's not uh, everywhere. Not everyone has access to the same beauty. Whether we're talking about access to beautiful people or you know desirable uh, women or, but even beautiful things, beautiful objects, or or to beautiful to nature. But but the other side of nature is of course horror. Like a lot of nature, you know, to us as, as the kind of beings we are is is either incomprehensible, chaotic, dangerous, indifferent, um, or downright um, just like unbearable to see, to look at, you know. Um, you don't need to see a cow struck by lightning to understand that like a lot of nature is just like very, very um, alien actually. And this is a kind of entheogenic insight as well, that the alienness of non-human nature, even if you have also a kind of unity type feeling, is also like, like things about flies, you know, Jung talks about flies, they're like, 
what the hell are flies? And you start to think of them, so, them as like, I don't know, little information gathering machines or something. And you're like, oh, these are really weird. Like, okay, I have something in common with flies, but I'm not sure. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, and yeah, so I don't know. So, so yeah, so I think uh, we can only understand beauty if we have an experience of horror and maybe horror is a, is a provocation to thought like like all like negative states are absolutely provocations to thinking it's th thinking is not some beautiful upright process or you know and certainly not a rational only or or rarely a rational calculating thing it's it's often a yeah a very disturbing experience in fact and philosophy can and should be very disturbing i think yeah. Well, for the flip side of that, more than ever, it seems to me at least, that, that people are uh, dropping acid, uh, they're, they're doing mushrooms, uh, these um, uh, these drugs, uh, these substances, uh, these aptitudes are, are being decriminalized. Uh, people are going on shamanic retreats. They're doing therapy with actual uh, medical doctors and PhD and psychologists while on LSD or MDMA uh, and other part peak experiences. And, and perhaps this would have been hard or impossible for previous generations, or at least uh, it wasn't a socially acceptable acceptable. But if so many more people are, are doing things like this, as well as stuff like meditation, right? I actually work as a, as a meditation coach in, the, in a secular sense, right? So more than ever, people are meditating. Um, I, I, I think a previous generation would have thought that these experiences would be enough for a mass societal change. But it doesn't seem like things are getting better or that there's a change. So, so what's up with all of these, uh, this mainstreaming of, of peak experiences and why isn't it working? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. And I, I mean, you know, I mean, actually seen in a kind of horrific light, you could say we actually do live in the, uh, the era, the post LSD era, like, I mean, you know, Silicon Valley in the sixties and Steve Jobs and, and all of these boomers who dropped acid are in a way that the, the creators of the world we live in you know so we actually already live in an lsd universe um and not necessarily in a good way in fact in many ways we, we, we're more trapped than we were you know so there's there's absolutely obviously no guarantee for example of the the kind of outcome or, or the beneficial effects um either individually or collectively of um psychedelics for example and yeah i mean it's it is interesting that you do see more people pushing for um you know psychedelics to be deregulated or legalized even um you know things about microdosing which people are often i mean I, I i don't understand microdosing at all i think it's bollocks but i mean people think that uh you know it makes you more creative so people are taking it to go to work and yeah i mean this just seems you know not great <laughs> but um so so i mean I, you know i think like all of these things they they you know there's a dark side and a light side and uh, you know what if if you don't translate your insights into everyday behavior and this would the same would go for all religious practices you know then then they, they are kind of relatively meaningless or if you kind of pervert them you know for some other reason um i mean of course it's possible right all of these things can be used in particularly negative ways and yeah i mean you have to wonder about mm, i don't know Yes, like what vested interests there are in the kind of um, increasing use of, of psychedelics, like are there other things going on there too? And, you know, I mean, you, you people can achieve different kinds of entheogenic states without psychedelics, right? I mean, you can do it if you don't eat for a while, or you can do it if you, you know, enter into kind of various other spiritual um, situations that don't require, you know, drugs in that sense um whether we want to call them drugs or not another question i mean we also have to note that this is a very class-based thing too i mean it's largely middle class people or creative class people who are advocating and using um these drugs in in this way you know and i think this is again this is a kind of question of redistribution um you know what would it mean to actually have a kind of fully fair psychedelic society i mean this isn't just an idea, but rather a kind of practice. And I'm not sure, you know, I honestly don't know. I mean, I mean, these are also very powerful drugs, you know, and, and I think they're not, you know, not everyone is in the right position to take them or would want to, you know, and that's completely comprehensible too. And I think if it becomes a matter of like feeling compelled or feeling like you must take, you know, acid or mushrooms, you know, that would also, that would be, that would be horrible. Like that would be another kind of nightmarish, um, situation so i think that there must be very people must be very careful around these things you know not 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 to not to make them sound frightening but 
they are powerful you know we shouldn't think that they're not i guess <laughs> yeah um the on an episode of the lack uh, i think uh recently one of the last couple of episodes you you mentioned just in passing uh uh esoteric perennialism and i, I was wondering if you if we could explore what you meant by that uh, what's your definition of that do you believe in it and and i suspect um th th that it would be coming back to the beginning of the episode of talking about uh the paganism in nature but but maybe not but yeah could, could you tell us a little bit about that please yeah, I, su I suppose so, you know, I've been reading a bit of um, Grenon and uh, René Grenon and, and, you know, what he says about the, the kind of reign of quantity, you know, and his critique of, if you like, um, that form of uh, a kind of psychic measurability or the way in which particularly Western societies um, have, because of their relationship to action and because of various sort of developments in kind of scientific understanding, um, end up in these kind of thought patterns or these ways of seeing everything in terms of, of quantity and 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 how that then reconditions the whole I suppose which which kind of a, occludes or obscures um, various traditions or patterns or the way in which we can actually make links between different um, religion or particular insights which which may look slightly different but also have a kind of deep similarity um, you know across countries and, and that kind of way of thinking has obviously become very unfashionable and I, I mean I'm very interested in people like um, Eliardo and Culiano and um, you know and also Dumazil and when he talks about uh, the Roman gods um, and the kinds of things that you you learn when you read these sort of thinkers who are trying to do this kind of um, uh, making these links across language for example so like when we talk about proto-indo-european and looking for similarities in the use of like the word for man like via where we get the word virtue and virility and you know looking for those patterns and i think in the current academy that type of thought is is so um unfashionable but sort of also deliberately kind of <laughs> put to one you know even not even mentioned yeah. you know um and you know for, for various reasons, I think. Um, and having worked in the contemporary university for 13 years, um, and I I left for a variety of reasons, but one of them was the large, largely was, well, I mean, I was very sort of unwell when I left, but was largely because um, I didn't think that the thinking was happening there particularly. You know, I, I, I it became a very sort of increasingly anxious place to work. Um, and I think people were feeling, very including the students not not through any fault of their own but i think they were feeling inhibited basically by fear of saying the wrong thing and you know a kind of sort of climate of self-censorship and you know and i did i i just thought well that's not why i started doing philosophy it wasn't <laughs> so that i could you know end up you know around people who were too afraid to to think and so yeah so i left and uh I think since then I have been thinking more and better. <laughs> yeah. and people who have that experience, you know, say the same. Yeah. Well, I, I think I found out about you and your work through One Dimensional Woman, which I read, you know, a long time ago. But I understand that that, that you have a new book coming out that that's kind of a, command, a companion piece to it, which is What Do Men Want? Could you tell us a, a bit about this book? Yeah, sort of. I mean, One Dimensional Woman is really weird now because it's a very short pamphlet type thing, the polemic that I wrote in my like when I was like 23. Um, and it it's it's kind of in a critique of consumer capitalism and you know how how feminism is sort of being used as a kind of tool to um create certain kinds of subjects. And um it's it's written a long time, if you like, before some of the current debates around gender. So it doesn't actually like it's a kind of weirdly out of place book now, I think. And I it has a critique of work in there, which I which I stand by, um, but I'm not sure about some of the rest of it. You know, I think it, it does feel like a very long time ago to me. And so the book on men, um, yeah, is 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 actually, <laughs> and now it's very controversial to be reasonable, but it's an attempt to look at the situation of men in the West in the 21st century uh, amidst all of these um, accusations of toxic masculinity and you know, these sort of denunciations of men as a class and to try to say, well, what's actually going on? And, and you know, to look at 
for example, particular forms of male suffering, so male suicide rates and various forms of violence that men inflict on themselves and others, um, but to and, e and e even in a way to sort of address some of the concerns of the men's rights activists who are generally kind of shunned and, and you know, and scorned and sneered at um, by the liberal left, but actually to say, well, is there, you know, what's the truth of this? You know, what what's, what is actually going on? Um, and to try to suggest that men and women are not kind of fundamentally opposed, um, but now we live in a mixed world, we actually have to get on with each other and that we, you know, in our difference and uh, in our shared experience of a, a kind of um, unknowingness, actually, you know, that we both don't know <laughs> what the right thing is to do, um, that there is somehow like a kind of um, a need for a kind of reconciliation um, after things like Me Too and so on. So it's it's actually uh, a kind of quite gentle book in a way, I would say, but it's it's possibly kind of, I don't know, I don't know how it's going to be received, probably not very well, but I, I don't really care. But I think, you know, if it's controversial, it's because I'm trying to say that it's men and women can and do get along and actually we need to and you know that the, the this divisive rhetoric you know isn't helpful you know like just as it's not helpful to sort of mischaracterize all women as one kind of thing it's it doesn't help to do it to men and and the, i mean i guess it's sort of girardian now i come to think about it it's like you know the scapegoating must stop you know what how do we how do we stop the escalation you know and come together in in our unknowingness i suppose <laughs> Yeah. Well, on this topic, and I'm really sorry because you, you, you said a poetic phrase that sort of stuck in my head, but I can't remember <laughs> where or when, and maybe it's just something that, that you said in passing, but you said that you're interested in the, the cosmic relationship between men or women. Is, is there any chance of elaboration on that? Be, uh, uh, because you know what you're describing doesn't sound doesn't necessarily sound cosmic, but uh, it also no. sounds good, but yeah. No, it, it doesn't. You're right, because in a way, what I'm describing is the the black iron prison <laughs> well, yeah um for sure and, and in a way i kind of have to start there and i think it makes sense to do that right like i, I mean i do talk about the cosmic dimension in the book but very very briefly and also it's because it's a popular book right it's not a yeah. it's not a esoteric you know whatever it's not even a philosoph philosophical book or it's it's very very popular and you know it's for a popular mainstream publisher and i mean you know i think they would have probably preferred a kind of I hate men polemic, but that isn't what they got. So anyway, here we are. Um, but the cosmic thing, yeah, I mean, I suppose, again, it's a kind of entheogenic um, feeling. So, I mean, it's, you know, theologically, there is this question about whether you begin with with one thing or two things or infinite things uh, or nothing, I suppose, right? So you can do it through maths, you can do it through music, you can do it through uh, thinking about sexual difference. And, you know, obviously there are, for example, religions um, for which, um, the the duality or the binary, however you want to put it, of man and woman are absolutely fundamental to the the theology, if you see what I mean, or to the thinking. Um, and I think it's a kind of it's a way of thinking about the world in terms of you know whether you think about yin yang or shiva shakti or um, polarities or positions um, that that in a way starts with the two rather than the one. And and so it's it's there's something kind of um, I don't know sort of uh, intellectually and uh, sexually even interesting to think about that. Um, it's one way of thinking about how everything is and what the reality of things are, I suppose. And I think because there has been this sort of um, attempt to occlude or um, sexual difference as such, I'm interested in the reason why that has come to constitute our culture so dominantly. So why our culture seeks to downplay sexual difference um, in the name of a kind of economically neutral subject like the worker, for example. And, and this is something that Ivan Illich um, also talks about in his 1982 book, Gender, which he got very, very, very cancelled for um, and his reputation never really recovered and he was attacked by feminists and so on. But I think what he was trying to describe in pre-industrial world was a what he described what he calls vernacular gender which is the idea of kind of separate but overlapping spheres that didn't even in a way have a name um, and he thinks what industrial society does is um, eliminate a vernacular gender which is gender related to place and practice and objects and even to magic actually 
um, and to taboo um, in favour of cr constructing this um, neutral sex, sort of unsexed subject, right? So people are indifferently male or female, and from the standpoint of the economy, this this seems correct, especially knowledge economies, right, where where the body or your physicality um, isn't particularly important in some of the jobs that are that dominate in the West. So. Um, so I'm interested in in what the occlusion of sexual difference actually does in, in terms of limiting our knowledge, our knowledge yeah. of each other and our knowledge of ourselves. Amazing. And uh, you also recently re uh, uh, put out a book called Platforms. Can you tell us a, a little bit about it? Mm. <laughs> Platforms is a is a strange letter that is a kind of a series of stream of consciousness reflections um, in a written in a state of being that I could only describe as anguished. Um, I suppose it's to do with um, unrequited love in some way. It's a letter to somebody um, who the narrator, who may or may not be me, um, is writing to and because um, she feels unable to do anything else. So it's a kind of um, a necessary outpouring in a way of feeling um, it is characterized by a certain, I suppose, uh, yeah, anguished, slightly masochistic tone. Um, and I, I wanted to, I, I mean, I wasn't originally going to publish it at all, but I sent it to um, Lewis, who's um, my friend who runs Morbid Books. And he, he said, I want to publish this. Um, I was like, fine, whatever. And, but I, but I realized that I, I, I wanted to too, because I think it's, that feeling, those feelings that I that I try to express in the book, are feelings that are so deeply embarrassing, for and shameful for many people because pretty much everyone has had an experience of unrequited love, but it's one of those things that's actually like very hard to talk about because it is so humiliating, and shameful. And I thought there was something kind of I'm interested in these kind of acts of honesty as well. And I think that you know we live in a very like dishonest age um and i think when i had my sort of midlife crisis or whatever you want to call it um i i sort of found myself in a situation where i didn't want to lie about things and i wasn't lying all the time but i was definitely lying to myself for example about my relationship to alcohol and i was trying to pretend that everything was fine and i was working really hard and um you know i wasn't in control of my life and i and then i thought well partly the problem was i wasn't I didn't feel able to be honest and then I thought oh let's let's be honest all the time you know as insofar as that's possible and so I thought I'd just publish this very honest book that is also kind of humiliating you know because also when you're being attacked by other people and you know and I get attacked a lot for things I said and you know people are very keen to do this sort of thing now to lot you know I'm not the only one lots of people are attacked and I I thought well there, there's something kind of interesting about putting out something that is is deeply honest and shameful as if to say to people who want to criticize me well there's nothing you can say that is as shameful as the way that I've I felt you know about myself and <laughs> yeah yeah it, 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 it's strange because I agree that we live in a very dishonest age and it's it's hard to put across the these sort of shameful embarrassing sides of ourselves but paradox because we always have to be a brand however online we see a lot of vulner fake vulnerability like where people are sharing or shaping their vulnerability as part of their brand. I, I, I don't know what yeah. I'm trying to say, but it, this is this is an obsession that I have that does come up on this show a lot uh, that, that I think is a Gnostic theme, right? Because the, the, the Gnosticism is, is very much about identity as well and exploring identity, looking at identity, playing of identity, both human and divine. So th I, I find this very worrying, freaky, demiurgic, arconic, this constant need Need to to brand oneself and how we can um, uh, cr use even these these you, it, it's it, it, the the negative parts are then become part of the brand. Am I making sense, Doctor Power? Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, yeah. definitely. And I think I mean you 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 you're absolutely right. And I think I think one of the things one of the sort of trends in fiction is towards auto fiction because it's like. Um, it's actually also because it's safer because yeah. if you write about yourself then you're not making grand claims you're not trying to you know you might you're not running the risk of getting you know saying the wrong thing and getting cancelled for you know 
I mean, you know, the kind of restrictions on on fiction now are quite extreme. Like you, you know, it's it's difficult for people to write characters outside of their own race or outside of their own sex. You know, like people are getting kind of pulled up on uh, representation. So you can see why, um, on the one side, you know, why people might say, "Well, I'm writing about myself, so you can't criticize me for that." So even if you criticize the book, you you know, you can't attack me for misrepresentation. Um, but of course, you're right that the the negative aspect of that is that um the blurring of the boundary or like there is no kind of limit to the exposure of the self or the you know the the, the kind of cultural narcissism as Lash would say you know every everyone is encouraged to share or overshare or emote or um you know to be uh to be vulnerable and but I think I think the interesting point comes at least for me when I think about this is like is is the universality of suffering you know it's like everybody yeah. suffers you know if people want to try and put these in some kind of hierarchy like this is this is very dangerous to do that to say or to say that some people's suffering matters and other people's suffering doesn't you know so for example in the book about men you know it's like male suffering is largely uh oh, i don't know if not mocked is kind of denigrated it's you know there's a lot of mainstream liberal media that just kind of pretends that men don't suffer you know uh, or that their suffering is meaningless and this can't possibly be the case right it's not a zero-sum game right to be alive is to suffer like everybody suffers some sometimes more than others sometimes people go mad sometimes people are addicted sometimes people are very sad sometimes people are hot you know like everybody has an experience of suffering and so i suppose even in this kind of um sharing there is perhaps something of an attempt to um collectivize or to have a kind of um point to something deeper which we are all tapping into um which is this discomfort or this alienation or separation and and so on and of course that can be part of a branding of an individual self and and so on and yeah it's 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 a very difficult question like how do you hollow out you know there are various practices ascetic practices or otherwise or religious um transformations that people go undergo you know actually even public denunciation is a form of religious ritual you know yeah. to to be denounced is a is a is a an experience in fact you know because it it actually forces you to to decide what it is you value apart from anything else you know because you're if worldly things are kind of taken from you like and you're you're left bereft of friends or you know you lose your jobs you lose your friends like these these are potentially um spiritual experiences you know because the kind of learning or understanding that takes place through the experience is not something you can um you know understand if you haven't gone through it <laughs> um, yes exactly yeah. well you know and the gnostics have, have this great phrase to to ascend you must first to descend right and of course jung has these uh these ideas about you know going through the uh the, these darkened states uh and it's a very common idea of course in religion right um not all religions but particularly mystical religions the dark night of the soul and such enact it not just internally but externally uh dr power unfortunately we should start to wrap up um but uh oh could you tell people uh, about your sub stack and about your podcast Oh gosh. Okay. Um, so the I do a weekly podcast called The Lack, which is um is more sort of psychoanalytic and philosophical than Gnostic, but I we we do touch on sort of similar themes related sometimes. And uh my co-presenters are Helen Rollins and Benjamin Studebaker, who are both amazing. Um so Helen is coming from a kind of more psychoanalytic perspective, and Benjamin Studebaker is an excellent um political theorist. Um, and he, he thinks a lot about kind of class and strategy and, and the current state of um, thinking on the, you know, in, in political sphere. And then I'm, I'm coming from a, I don't know, sort of deranged, like <laughs> psychotic <laughs> philosophical <laughs> position. Um, and yeah, it's called The Lack and that's on uh, Patreon. And I have a sub stack uh, where I where I precisely express my, my romantic, uh, spontaneous <laughs> words that uh, seek to escape from the machine it capture and the, you know, the regulate the regulated homogenous world. So I this is where I try to to to, um, yeah, just in a way, enter into a trance like state and 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 uh spill over so that's um yeah that's just nina power at, uh, dot substack dot com wonderful dr power thanks so much no thank you it was great thanks bye <laughs>